So Philippians chapter 2, uh, the first thing I want to point out here in this chapter is the doctrine of the Trinity. This just kind of jumps off the page here. If you want to look there in verse 6, it says, Who being in the form of God, now who's the who there? Right, that's Jesus. It says in verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So to be equal with God is to be is to be God, right? You know, and sorry Mormons, you know, that's basically what they teach. They're going to be gods one day. What you're saying is you're going to be God. Now Jesus could say that because we understand that he is God, you know, and was God. Go over to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We'll compare some scripture tonight. John chapter 5. <coughs> so he said there that he didn't think it was robbery to be equal with God. He was in the form of God but he was also equal with God, right? And to be equal with God is to say that you are God. And you see that here in John chapter 5. And we'll just jump into it here in verse 18. This is, of course, where he, uh, Jesus heals the lame man and he takes up his bed and walks and he goes and the, 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 the Pharisees get all upset because he's healing on the Sabbath day. And then there's this dispute here. And then uh, eventually we get down to verse 18. We'll, we'll back it up to verse 17. It says, But Jesus answered them, My father worketh here too, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So what was upsetting them so much was that he had made himself equal with God. Why did that upset them? Because what he was saying is, I'm God, right? You recall in other passages where he said, you know, I am that I am, right? He's, he claimed to be the I am, which is to say, I'm God. So they understood this. You know, they understood that when he was saying he was making himself equal with God, that he was saying, I am God, okay? So we could see here, in, if you want to go back to Philippians, the fact that Jesus is saying, or rather Paul is saying that Jesus is God. Why, how is he saying it? Because he's saying, he was equal with God. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Okay? So, you say, well, how is this the Trinity? Okay, well, look at verse 9. Verse 9, it says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. Now, who's the him there? Jesus, right? And we just got done establishing that Jesus made himself equal with God, thereby making himself God. And then you get to verse 9, where he's saying that God exalted him. So did God, did Jesus exalt himself? No, he didn't. And I was trying, I was, I wanted to talk uh, my son into demonstrating this. And so, but I need a brave volunteer. No one? You're all, nobody? You're too big for it. All right, come on up. Just sit right here. Just sit right here. I want to demonstrate what it means to be exalted. Okay? Now you understand why I can't, couldn't use you. I was trying to convince little Corbin to let me just lift him over my head during the service, but he wouldn't go for it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exalt you out of the chair. Take my hand, right, and I'm just going to exalt you, right? Did you, I lifted you up. I exalted you. Did you exalt yourself? No. Who exalted you? Me. I did, right? Could, are we the same person? No. No, it's that simple. Thank you. Take a seat. <laughs> right? I mean, it really is that simple. And you say, well, this is, you know, this is pretty elementary. Yeah, but people miss that. There's people out there that that just goes right over the head because they have not the doctrine of Christ. And they, they don't understand these things. They're not saved. Okay? <laughs> so I think it's pretty obvious right there that you know, Jesus is making himself equal with God. And then just a few verses later, three verses later, you have God exalting Jesus, showing us the Trinity here. right? And you know, for a bonus, you could even jump down and say, well, what about the Holy Spirit? And he's, down, he's in here. Where he says in, uh, let me find it here. For it is God that worketh in you. I know it's in there. We just read it. I'm not going to take the time to try and find it. But it's in there. 13. 13. Thank you. I wanted to say 13. Yeah, it's underlined. For it is God which worketh in you, right? Both to do and to good of his, both to do of his good pleasure, to will and to do of his good pleasure. So who is it that works in us? It's the Holy Spirit. So even in this passage, you've got Jesus making himself God. You've got 
God the Father exalting him to the glory of the God the Father, and then you have God work it, which worketh in you. So this is a great passage, I think, on the Trinity. But I don't want to focus on that tonight. There's some other things we need to talk about. But if you look there, uh, the other thing we'll see is that Paul makes these two requests, right? Paul makes these two requests. He, verses 1 through 4, he's kind of talking about what he expects from the Philippian people within the church, okay? And he's expressing the desire that there would be unity there. And remember, that's the, a major theme in this book, you know, joy and unity, because those things are connected. You can't have joy if there isn't unity. So verses 1, for, one through 4, that's a major uh, theme that we see being repeated. But then you see another request that he makes there in verses 14 and 15, where he says, Do all things without murmuring and disputings. They may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights. So Paul's making this request to Philippians of how they should conduct themselves within the church in verses 1 through 4, but then he's also wanting them to conduct themselves a certain way as lights that shine in, in the world, right? So let's look at the first one, unity in the church. What does this look like? And we're going to go over this quickly because I, I feel like we spent some time on the subject because it, it's, it's a theme in Philippians. But he says there uh, in the beginning of verse 2, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love. So what does unity look like within the church? It's being like-minded, right? Meaning we're going to be of one accord. We're going to have the same opinion about things. We're going to think about things the same way. We're going to have the same spiritual disposition about things. We're going to agree on things, right? So be like-minded. You know, have the same opinion. But he also says there, having, uh, having the same love. Having the same love. And of course, you could probably look at this different ways. You could say, well, you know, having the same love, we should all love Christ. Yeah, that's a given. But I think really what he's saying here is having the same love is that we don't want to be, we want to be uh, impartial. We don't want to judge um, with partiality. We don't want to show favoritism. You know, everyone is deserving of the same love, the same uh, Christian uh, brotherly love one toward another. We should try to express that to everyone, not say, well, I, I'm going to love this brother in Christ, but this one over here, not so much. We should love one another equally. I mean, that's what Jesus, you know, he said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one toward another. I mean, they're supposed to be able to look at the church and look how we treat one another and how we uh, love one another and say, oh, these are Christians. And that should be something that, that makes us stand out. So we should have the same love. We should also, it says in verse 3, not striving, right? In verse 3, he said, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Not striving, but esteeming others better. So this is how you're going to have the unity in the church. And this is Paul's request. He's saying, fulfill ye my joy. You know, this is something that he wants them to do, and this is how you're going to go about doing that. You're going to have to have uh, one mind, you have to be agreement and harmony, and you have to have, uh, you know, uh, the same doctrine, the same Bible. I mean, how are we going to have unity in a church? How are we going to be of one mind if we're all using different versions of the Bible? If we're going to these churches where, you know, this guy over here has, you know, the ESV, and this guy over here has the New American Standard, and he's using the New King James, they all say different things. Yeah, they might agree on a lot of points, but they, they, they say a lot of different things, too. What if we had different doctrine? You know, this, and, and this is something that's out there today, especially in the day and age we're, we're living in, when there's just a lot of this ecumenicalism where everybody just wants to kind of just make it, you know, just let's not talk about what makes us different. Let's just all be the same. You know, just talk about what makes us the same. But the things that make us different are important, you know, and there, and there should be division. But, you know, within the church, we should all agree on the same doctrine. We should all have the same, come to the same conclusion. We should all be of one mind, one accord. Now, obviously, we're going to disagree on small things. You know, we're going to disagree on, you know, smaller points of doctrine, but on the major things, like the one I just touched on, the Trinity, which is a pretty obvious doctrine, you know, which is a, a pretty orthodox doctrine. There should be some doctrines that we're just, we're all on the same page together. We're all the same mind. And we're not striving. We're esteeming others better than, 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 than ourselves. We're looking on the things of the others. We're unselfish. We're sacrificing. We're mindful of brethren and what the needs are and things like that 
So this is what unity looks like. And I don't want to, again, spend a lot of time on that, but how is it achieved? That's really the important thing. It's one thing to say, well, that's what Paul wants, and I know what it is, but how do I make it happen? How do I you know, demonstrate these things in my life? How do I be somebody who's going to love impartially? How am I going to be somebody who uh, observes these things without preferring one or above another, doing nothing by partiality? How am I going to do that? What's it going to take for me to not strive, but to esteem others better than myself? How am I going to accomplish that? Well, you're going to have to follow Christ's example. That's what he does, right? He makes this request. He tells them this is what's expected within the local church, this unity. This is what it looks like. But he goes on and says in verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So after giving the example, or actually making the request, I should say, then he gives the example how to do it. He says, this is what Jesus did. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. You know, he didn't strive. He didn't do things through vain glory. He looked not on his own things, but on the things of others. He made himself of no reputation <clears throat> and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now, you want to talk about humility. That's a great example. I mean, that, that is God condescending to man, coming down and, and taking on the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men. We're talking about God that did that. And he did that, you know, that we should follow in his steps. That's how we're going to, that's why Paul's going here. Because Paul, it's real clear what he wants. Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. He wants unity. And then he, and it's not like he's just switching subjects and, to, oh, let me talk about Jesus for a minute. And then we're going to go back to do nothing, you know, do things and, uh, you know, don't murmur and dispute. You know, these things are, you know, these requests that he's making at the beginning and the end of the chapter are, like, in between those, we find the example of Christ. He's not just switching gears. He's pointing us to Christ. That's how we're going to achieve this, is having the, letting this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. And it says in verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. So how are we going to achieve and maintain Unity within the local church and do all these things that Paul's talking about through humility, through esteeming others better than, 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 than ourselves. And that's basically what humility is, isn't it? Saying, well, let me just put your needs above my own. You know, that's a humble, that takes humility. And Bible says only by pride cometh contention, which is the opposite of unity. Pride being the opposite of humility, contention being the opposite of unity. Look, if we want unity in the local church, you want unity in any relationship, really, if you want to, talk, you want to go there with it. Not just out, even outside the church, in a marriage, in, uh, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a relationship between uh, parents and children. There has to be humility there, doesn't there? Somebody has to esteem other better than themselves and say, well, you know, let me do what mom and dad want. Let me, do, let me sacrifice myself from what my spouse wants and put other people above ourselves. That's how you achieve unity in these relationships. That's how you're going to achieve unity inside the local church is through humility. And, you know, it's, it's often easier said than done. You know, we understand this, but putting into practice a lot of times is a little bit more difficult, which is why he, again, is pointing us to Jesus and saying he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. I mean, that's how far he went with it, even the death of the cross. <clears throat> and we have to ask ourselves how how. How far are we willing to let our humility take us? How much are we willing to sacrifice of our own selves for others and, and lift them up above our own selves? <clears throat> so that's how it's achieved. Not, have, not worrying about a reputation, just being a servant. You know, being a servant. He made himself of no reputation, but took upon himself the form of a servant. You can't be a servant and then want to have a reputation. You know, people who are serving just to be seen of men are in it for the, they're, they're not doing it for the right reasons. And, you know, that's a real telltale sign about a person's character. You know, that, that's a red flag. You know, and I've run into people like that who've, who've said, you know, they, they, they want to put themselves out there. They, they oh, I want to help in the church. I really want to serve. Oh, okay, great. Go scrub that toilet over there. Oh, I'm not doing that. I've had people say that. Say, well, what can I do to help? Well, we really need help cleaning. And look, we don't need it here. We, it's pretty small. You know, it takes me like 10 minutes to vacuum. But I'm saying in the past, and this, you know, someone's it's all zealous, oh, I want to serve. 
Well, the bathrooms need to get clean between services. I was thinking song leading. I was thinking, you know, maybe I'd fill the pulpit. Or I'd do something where I could have a reputation where somebody would say, oh, look at so-and-so. Wow, he's so good at this, so good at that. But that's not real humility, is it? Because real humility makes, you know, it makes yourself, of, it, you become a servant for the right reasons. You make yourself of no reputation. That's what a servant does. They're not doing it to, to get recognized. They're doing it to serve because that's what they want to do. <coughs> so this is how unity is achieved by following Christ's example, having his mind, not worrying about a reputation, but taking upon our own selves uh, the form of a servant by humility and, of course, you know, the big word there is obedience, being obedient. So this is our testimony that this is Paul's request for within the Philippian church. This is what he wants. He wants them to, you know, be, have this unity. We see what it looks like, and we see how we achieve it through Christ, right? He's our example. But I want to focus more here on verses 14 and 16 where he talks about our testimony in the world, our testimony in the world. If you look there in uh, verses 14 and 16, do all things without murmuring and disputings, that you may be harmless, uh, blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So this is his desire for them in the world. Okay, And in the world, he says, do all things without, dis without, uh, without murmurings and disputings. So what are murmurings and disputings? That's basically, well, murmuring is complaining, right? You should do all things without complaining. You should do all things without disputings. What are disputings? Disputings are arguing, right? And you could apply this, you know, in any relationship again. I mean, but this is specifically what he's saying about how we should conduct ourselves in the world. Okay, you know, we, obviously we, shouldn't, we should conduct ourselves like this at all times, but specifically... Uh, when we're living in a perverse and cr uh, crooked nation, you know, we should shine as lights. And if all we're doing is murmuring and complaining and arguing, you know, we're not going to shine as lights. That's what the world does. Is there a lot of complaining out there? Isn't there a lot of arguing? I mean, it makes up whole television programs where it's just nothing but people arguing, right? So if we're gonna if we're gonna shine as lights, right? We're gonna be a beacon. For God in the world, we're going to do that by being different. We're not going to be like them. We're not going to argue the way they do. We're not going to uh, murmur and complain the way they do. And I think this really, you could apply this when it comes to, um, again, anywhere in, in, in any area of life, but specifically when it comes to work. If you want to go to Ephesians chapter number 6, Ephesians chapter number 6. If you want to succeed at work, you know, you should be a person who's known as, uh, you don't want to be known as a person who murmurs and complains and argues. Even if you're right. <laughs> this, is, this is something I figured out a while ago, right? And it helped me in my, my uh, job. Not just this one. <laughs> Although in this one, I'm usually not right. <laughs> There's a problem. I'm usually the one who's wrong. But even in times past, other jobs where I've, I know I'm right. I know I'm right. And, and the boss comes to me and says, this is wrong. It's not my fault. Maybe it's somebody else. You know, sometimes it's better to say, well, I'll, I'll just fix it. Because, you know, that's what the boss wants. That's all he cares about. He just wants the problem fixed, right? But if we want to argue and just dispute, well, I know this, and you don't understand, you know, that's not going to help us. If we're just somebody who can just get it right and fix things, that's going to help us. We don't want to be people who murmur and complain and argue. If you're there in Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse 5. It says, Servants, be obedient unto them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart as unto Christ. That's pretty, that's pretty serious. I mean, you're gonna, that's how we're supposed to serve our you know, masters there being you know, our, those are employers, right? Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart, as unto Christ. We should submit ourselves to them as, we would, as if we were submitting ourselves unto Christ. Not because they're godly, not, you know, not just because they're, you know, uh, they might not even be saved, right? But he tells us that we should, we should do so to the forward, you know, to, to the good and to the forward, to the just and the unjust. 
And why is that? He says in verse 6, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Because if we go to our job, even if we have a bad boss, and we're the type of person that just does what we're told, we don't argue, we don't complain, we have a good attitude, you're going to shine as a light to that boss. You're going to be a good testimony, aren't you? You're going, to, you're going to be as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. And he says to do it there, not with eye service. You know, and this is another good principle to apply at work, too. Not to be some, one of these people that just, whenever the boss shows up, you get real busy. And, you know, when he goes, you know, then it's, you know, then it's, it's time to slack again, you know, and then and do whatever we want. And that type of thing's out there. You know, that's, you'll find that, that and that's, that's probably a real common mentality. At least that's what I've noticed on a lot of jobs that I've been on. I've seen people where it's, you know, the guy's in the shop all day. The place isn't getting cleaned up. The boss comes in. All of a sudden, he looks real busy. All of a sudden, you know, things are getting moved around and put away, and the vacuum's getting run and whatever. I was like, well, wasn't he paying you to do that the rest of the time? You know, put away the deck of cards, you know, get off your phone and get to work, right? Because that's a bad testimony. That's a bad testimony because... Your boss says no. We like they, people think they're fooling their boss. Like they look, man, they remember what this place, and I'm thinking about a specific example, all right. The boss walks in and says, the place looks exactly the way it did yesterday when I left, and it's three in the afternoon. You know, it means, shows me you haven't done anything, you know. You haven't been, you haven't been working at all. They know what it looks like when somebody's been busy getting something done. I mean, we know that as parents. You could tell when you walk in the room if the kids have bothered to clean up or not, right? So you've been in here for an hour. I told you an hour ago to clean this room. Oh, I cleaned. Cleaned what? Nothing's picked up. You know, oh, no, you, don't understand. you didn't see me. I was real busy. <laughs> no, you weren't. It's obvious, right? But, you know, mom walks in, dad walks in, all of a sudden there's a lot of, all of a sudden, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of busyness all of a sudden, right? You know what that is? That's doing things with, with eye service. Oh, they're watching. Better look busy. That's what that is. And he says, don't do that. You don't want to do that with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ. You know, even if the boss isn't going to recognize that, even the boss isn't going to acknowledge that. You know, we're, again, you know, we might not get the reputation, but we're not doing it for that. We're doing it to be servants of Christ. And here's the thing. God does see that. God does see that. Look at verse 8. Knowing that whatsoever good, a good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord. So maybe the boss isn't going to recognize it. Maybe you're going to go there and you're going to work all day. You always have a good attitude. You don't murmur. You don't dispute. You don't argue and complain. You don't, you, you're, you stay busy, but the boss just never seems to recognize it. The boss never seems to, you know, well, one, you know, you're only done that, which is your duty to do, first of all. But even if the boss doesn't see it, you know, God does. God does still see it. Go over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9, Whatsoever thy hand, thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Do it with thy might. Why? Because in Proverbs it says, in all labor there is profit. In all labor there is profit. Well, I've been, I've been laboring really hard, and it doesn't seem like I'm profiting. And it's because we look at our paycheck. There's no profit here. But the Bible does say there's all pro there's, in all labor there is profit. A lot of time that profit comes not in the form of, you know, financial reimbursement. Sometimes it comes in the form of learning a lesson, developing a work ethic, building character. I know those aren't fun things, <laughs> right? But that's what makes people successful. You know, that's what's going to profit you in the long run is even if you go to that crummy job that's not going to, you know, give you everything you need, as long as you work hard, you're going to profit from it in some way, shape, or form by either develop, you know, I mean, I've worked, I remember working lousy jobs and, and developing skills there that took me to a better job. That's usually how it works. You know, when I, before coming on staff here, I was a locksmith and I moved out here knowing nothing about locksmithing, you know, and I had a wife and a kid and one on the way 
and no money in the bank except for maybe like two grand or whatever. And I wanted to be a locksmith. That's what I decided to do. So I found a job. It was paying like eight, was it like eight fifty? Eight? Seven? Eight twenty-five. Wow, that was seven. I was like, what was I thinking? <laughs> Uh, 825, I'm like 825 is a lot better. That was only eight years ago or less or no more. But you know, and that job, there wasn't a lot of profit financially. But you know what I learned? I learned how to pick locks, how to rekey locks, how to work on, how, how to work on Hondas, right? Those Honda, you saw me in that Honda, right? <laughs> Rekeying the Hondas and, and everything else and, and learning that craft, learning that trade. And you know what? Eventually that job took me to a better job, you know, working for the city of Phoenix. You know, and, and that job took me to an even better job after that. So how can I sit there and look at that job, though it was paying so little, and say, well, there's no profit here. The profit just wasn't immediate. You know, and that's, and that's how we work. That's how we're wired. We want things to pay off now. We want immediate gratification. Sometimes we just have to understand we just got to put in the work, put in the labor, knowing that the profit comes later, that it's a delayed gratification. There's, it's going to pay off. The reward comes down the road. Sometimes maybe even years. You know, I worked that job for years. A couple years before I got to move on to something better and, you know, double the pay or whatever. So in all labor, there is profit. Don't miss that. You know, if you have an opportunity to put in some work somewhere, take advantage of it. You know, and that's why, you know, when parents give kids chores to and things to do around the house, you know, they say, well, I'm not getting paid to do it. You know, I don't get paid. It's like, yeah, but you're still going to profit. Because you're going to learn how to do things that some people, there's people in this world that don't know how to do some of those things. They don't know how to cook. They don't know how to clean. They don't know how to run a, a tool. They don't know how to use a rake or a hammer. All they know how to stare at a screen. All they know how to do is just, you know, operate a joystick or, a, or a, you know, a remote control or a keyboard. You know, they've got that. Now, the keyboard's important, but the point is this. You know, if you're at home and your parents are giving, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. I mean, I, one of the chores I always got was dusting and, and, and cleaning windows. Didn't get paid, you know. I did get to live in a house that I didn't pay for. I did get to have clothes on my back I didn't pay for. I did get to put food in my belly I didn't pay for. And I guess you could look at that as payment. But you know what? Cl the cleaning those windows paid off. I mean, I know how to clean those windows back there now pretty good, Right? So we can develop these skills. They're profitable, right? In all labor, there's profit. So have a good attitude about it. You know, don't, don't have this attitude of, well, you know, it's not going to line my pocket. What's the point? Okay? Do all things without murmuring and disputing. You know, do, and, and serve the Lord, you know, as unto the Lord. You know, <coughs> where I have you go? Colossians 3? Colossians 3. Let's look at verse uh, 22. Colossians 3, that's totally the wrong one. That's not what I had. 1 Peter 5, 1 Peter 5. You know what? Go to Titus 2, Titus 2. Titus chapter 2. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants be subject unto your own masters with all fear, not only the good and gentle, but also to the forward. So it's not just the good boss. Well, I'll work hard for the good boss. I'll work, I'll work harder when they pay me more. I've literally heard people say that. I'm just going, you have it completely backwards. <laughs> You'll get paid more when you work harder. No, no. I will, I will work harder when they pay me more. You're you, that's a sure way to go nowhere. Look at uh, uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 9. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Now, Titus is a preacher, right? You say, why are you taking so long to talk about this? Because that's what Titus was told to preach. He said, not, he said exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. You know, there's people in the room that are servants, that have masters, that have bosses, that have uh, superiors, that have people that they're in subjection to, Right? So I, my job is to exhort you to be obedient unto your own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Now, what's the answering again? Disputings, arguings, talking back, right? And there's nothing more frustrating than that. 
you know, when, you, when you're trying to tell somebody, this is how I want it done, here's what you did wrong, whatever, and all they have is just some excuse. Well, no, and that's not, I didn't do it wrong. No, I know you did it wrong. <laughs> I know that what you did was wrong. I know you didn't do it right. I know you didn't do it the way I told you to do it. Don't, you know, and when we say, well, oh, no, they answer back, you know what they're saying is, you're stupid. That's what it feels like to the person that has to receive that. To have, when, they, when you start to answer back, you're basically saying, oh, you're stupid. No, you don't know the words that came out of your mouth. No, you don't know uh, what you told me to do. No, I do know what I told you to do. I do know what I asked of you. I do know how I explained it, and I know that you did it wrong. So don't answer back and make me out to be somebody who's stupid because I'm not stupid, right? You can amen that. But he's saying, not pr he's saying, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all, good thing in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may do what? What's the point of all this? Why, why do we have to work hard at uh, not murmuring and disputing as, as, as serving the Lord, as working as unto the Lord? Because it says right there that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. That's the point of it all. You know, that's where we started out in, in Philippians, if you want to go back there. The adorning of the doctrine of God. That's what he said there in Philippians chapter uh, 2, verse 15. They may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shone, shine as lights. <coughs> I'm sorry, back up verse 14. Do all things without murmuring, disputing. Why? So you can adorn the doctrine of Christ, of our Lord and Savior. Because that's what is going to reflect to your boss. Look, your boss doesn't care how faithful you are to church if you're a crummy employee. It's a bad testimony. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you read your Bible. I'm glad you memorize scripture. I'm glad you go soul winning and pray. <clears throat> but boy, when you show up on my clock, you stink as an employee. And all that doctrine that you love of Christ, you just drug through the mud as far as he's concerned. He's not impressed with any of that. All the thing he cares about is how good of an employee you are. Because guess what? That's what he's paying you to do. <clears throat> I don't go to, you know, I don't, well, I'm different because I work <laughs> for the church, but you don't get paid to go and be a good Christian. You get paid to go be a good employee. And if you want to be a good Christian, you'll be a good employee. That's what the Bible says. You know, you need to adorn the doctrine of Christ by, you know, doing all things without murmurings and disputings. So that should just tell us that, you know, our testimony is important. Our testimony is important. It's important within the church. It's important outside of the church. <clears throat> Now, I've got to wrap up, but there's one other verse in here I want to look at uh, tonight. And we'll probably finish up the rest next week, but he says in verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with trembling and fear. Now, this is one of those verses that can, especially if you've only read the Bible once or twice, or if you run it, sometimes people, you'll run into people who twist this. They'll say, see, the Bible says you have to work out your own salvation. You gotta, you gotta, salvation is, is by works, right? Now, that's not what it said, right? That's not what it's saying there at all. It's not saying that you have to work your way into heaven, work to be saved. If that's what it was saying, then you have a huge contradiction in Scripture, right? That's usually your first clue that you're misunderstanding the Scripture because we don't understand that the Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, for you know, doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished in all good works, right? We understand that the word of God is preserved, that it's perfect, that there are no contradictions in the word of God. So if we read a verse that seems to be saying the complete opposite of other verses that we've read, either the Bible has a contradiction in it, or we're not understanding it. So the Bible can't contradict itself, so we, you know, we're misunderstanding it, is the obvious answer. <coughs> Now, you can kind of see why people, maybe they're not going to go so far as say, oh, it's work salvations, but they'll read that and go, well, what does that mean? What is he saying here in verse 12? What does it mean to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? Well, when you start to look at the context, I think it's pretty clear that what he's saying, basically what he's saying here, to work out means to obey. That's how I take it. Because he's kind of using that interchangeably. He says, wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, right? Not as in my presence, but now more, much more in my absence, 
Work out your own salvation with trembling and fear. He's saying you obeyed in the past when I was present. Now I'm absent. I want you to work out or I want you to obey, right? <clears throat> and he says here uh, in verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you, both to do and to do will and to do of his good pleasure. So God is working. Why is it that we should work out our own fear, uh, our own salvation with fear and trembling? Because it is God that worketh in us, right? So verse 13 is showing us that God is working in us, right? And we need to work God's will out, right? That's what he's saying. Be, uh, verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So God that is in us has a will and he has a good pleasure for us. I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? God, you know, God wants us to do certain things. God has a will for us. God has commandments for us. You know, he said, uh, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? God is in us, but he also has a will for us. How do we work that out? How do we get God's will out? How do we get what God wants for us out of us? How does he get it out of us? Through obedience. Through obedience. By doing those things which he hath commanded us. So I think that's really what he's saying here. When he says to work out your own salvation, is basically saying just obey. It's just another way of saying be obedient, right? <clears throat> and we could go to Titus 3, we won't, but it says there, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. So part of that obedience is what? To be ready to work, right? <clears throat> and in the context, he's saying there, right, in the beginning, wherefore, my beloved, wherefore what? Because Christ as a servant was what? Obedient. You know, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death of the cross, right? Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, uh, not in, as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out. You know, we should obey and work out our own salvation because Christ was obedient. And he did God's will, even to the death. <clears throat> so we work out what is in us, as you've always obeyed, work out your salvation. So I think that's, you know, it can be a little bit of a tricky verse, but I think that's a, you know, a plausible explanation. That's how I take it anyway. You know, maybe uh, people might have other ideas. I don't explain that, but we know one thing for sure. He's not saying you need to work your way into heaven. That you need to work to be saved, because that would be a huge glaring contradiction in the word of God. And we know the Bible can't do that. So, Book of Philippians, great book. There's, there's a lot of great things in here. I mean, I mean, the Trinity's there. I mean, the Trinity's practically on every page in the New Testament. If, if you look for it, it's, it's up and down. But, uh, you know, we, we see that. We see the fact that, you know, Paul had to request for the Philippian people, didn't he? He wanted them to be unified in the church, but he also wanted them to have a good testimony abroad out in the world, right, to shine as lights. And what's interesting is that uh, he says there, in, in both of these things, his request, right? Look what it, the effect it has on Paul. And I'll close on this. He says in verse two, fulfill ye my joy, fulfill ye my joy, right? That ye be like-minded, so on and so forth. And then he goes into this explanation, do all things without murmuring and disputing. Look, when we have a good testimony, when we are unified in the church, that brings joy, doesn't it, to other people? It brings joy to, it brought joy to Paul in this instance, to hear their good report, you know? like we saw last week, to, uh, you know, to, to, to see a church that's unified, to see people that are a good testimony in the world, brings joy to Paul. You know, it brings joy to the pastor. It brings joy to the preacher to see God's people fulfilling these requests. You know, so we should do that. You know, we should want to bring joy to those people. And you know what? It's not, that's not the only reason to do it. We would benefit greatly, obviously, if we did that. You would be more successful in the job. Maybe you would get that raise, get that promotion, find a better job if you did all things without murmuring and disputing. You know, maybe we would have more joy in our own life if when we came to church, you know, we loved one another, you know, without preferring one above another. If, you know, if we, we would maybe be so focused on our own problems if we could esteem others better than ourselves and look upon, you know, not on our own things, but on the things of others. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.